Hello, saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 1, for broadcast on the 1st of January, 2020. Happy New Year! Coming up on Space Time. Could our Milky Way galaxy have two supermassive black holes? The Boeing Starliner returns safely to Earth. And NASA says its new SLS Super Heavy Lift launch system is ready for flight. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers are trying to discover whether or not the supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy has a smaller companion. A report on the pre-pressed physics website archive.org claims that observations of the orbits of some stars around the central black hole, known as Sagittarius A star, have come up with some anomalies which are difficult to explain. The study's lead author, Smanda Naos from the University of California, Los Angeles, says while there are numerous possible explanations for these anomalies, one of the more exciting ones is that it's been caused by a second black hole located near Sagittarius A star with at least 100,000 times the mass of our Sun. And although it's only an idea, that hypothesis might not necessarily be too far-fetched. You see, most, if not all, galaxies are thought to contain supermassive black holes at their centres, which are usually millions to billions of times the mass of our Sun. And our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is no exception. And there's still a lot of debate about which comes first, the galaxies or their central supermassive black holes. Did massive molecular gas and dust clouds collapse to form galaxies, with the densest part of the galaxy, its centre, collapsing deeper to form a supermassive black hole? Or did the supermassive black hole form from the mergers of smaller stellar mass black holes created out of the universe's first stars, monsters more than a hundred times as massive as our Sun, and then gravitationally attract stars and molecular gas and dust clouds around them? Later on, as galaxies grew by merging with other galaxies, their central supermassive black holes merged as well. And different stellar streams within the Milky Way show that our galaxy has consumed many smaller galaxies in the past, and is busy cannibalizing several others at the moment, including the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy and both the large and small Magellanic Clouds. So, as you can see, the idea of more than one supermassive black hole at the galactic center shouldn't really be all that unusual. Now, if correct, then these two supermassive black holes are involved in a gravitational dance, moving ever closer together until finally, inevitably, they merge. As their waltz continues, the gravitational interactions would affect the orbits of nearby stars. What Naos and colleagues have done is calculate how these supermassive black holes' gravitational tidal interactions would change the orbits of these surrounding stars. They then compared their predictions to actual observations of a well-studied star catalogued as S02, which orbits Sagittarius A star every 16 years. The observations show that the authors could rule out any possible second supermassive black hole, at least one with a mass above 100,000 times that of the Sun, or orbiting 200 astronomical units from Sagittarius A star, an astronomical unit being 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes, the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. However, that doesn't mean that a smaller or more distant companion black hole isn't hiding out there. And if it's there, NAOS has come up with a new way to try and detect it. Back in May 2018, S02 zoomed past the supermassive black hole at a distance of only around 130 astronomical units. 
and this allowed astronomers to undertake a unique test of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, our best understanding of how gravity works. According to general relativity theory, the wavelength of light emitted by a star stretches or redshifts as it moves out of the deep gravitational well of a supermassive black hole. And this is exactly what astronomers saw. NEOS plans to wait until the next close approach of S02 to Sagittarius A star in another 16 years' time, when he'll look for changes in the orientation of the star's elongated orbit. If Sagittarius A star does have a hidden partner, then this could alter the expected result. Another way to check could involve improvements in gravitational wave detection. The LIGO and VIRGO Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatories are able to measure tiny changes in the fabric of space-time caused by the merger of stellar-mass black holes and neutron stars. However, larger, supermassive black hole mergers would result in gravitational wave frequencies too low for LIGO to detect. But a planned space-based gravitational wave detector called LISA might be able to pick up the far lower frequencies generated by merging supermassive black holes at the galactic centre. For NEOs and colleagues, it's a case of wait and see. You're listening to Space Time, our first for the new year. Coming up next, Solar Cycle 25 stretches its grip, and later, Boeing Starliner returns safely to Earth, and a special New Year's Day science report looking back at some of the strangest, weirdest, and most unusual science stories of 2019. All that and lots more, still to come on Space Time. The Sun is showing more signs of moving into a new solar cycle. New observations from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory spacecraft show Solar Cycle 25 is strengthening its grip, with two new solar cycle sunspots detected on the solar disk, one in each hemisphere. Astronomers know the sunspots belong to the new solar cycle because of their reverse polarity, compared to Solar Cycle 24 sunspots. Hale's Law describes how sunspot polarities flip from one solar cycle to the next. So, during Solar Cycle 24, sunspots in the Sun's Southern Hemisphere had a negative over positive pattern, while the new Southern Hemisphere sunspot is the opposite, positive over negative, confirming it's a member of the new Solar Cycle 25. Likewise, the latest Northern Hemisphere sunspot also has a reverse polarity compared to the Northern Hemisphere sunspots of the previous Solar Cycle 24. The Sun is still at solar minimum, the period of least activity in the 11-year Solar Cycle. And it's an unusually deep and long-lasting solar minimum, with very little sunspot activity. And that's led some to speculate as to whether or not this could be an extended minimum, similar to the famous Maunder minimum of the 17th century, when sunspots were absent from the solar disk for decades, affecting climatic patterns on Earth described as a mini ice age in the Northern Hemisphere, during which the River Thames froze over. However, the appearance of new Cycle 25 sunspots, together with several similar sunspots during 2019, suggests that Solar Cycle 25 is evolving normally, with there being little chance of a new Maunder minimum taking place. Astronomers expect the new solar cycle to continue to evolve and strengthen in coming years, reaching a solar maximum peak sometime around July 2025. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, NASA says it's all systems go for its new SLS heavy lift launch system and a ring of fire solar eclipse seen across the Persian Gulf, India and Eastern Asia. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, after failing to reach the International Space Station on its maiden test flight, Boeing's new CST-100 Starliner has returned safely to Earth, making a perfect pinpoint landing at the White Sands Missile Range in the New Mexico desert. The capsule's on-target touchdown went somewhere towards ameliorating the computer mission clock glitch, which two days earlier failed to carry out an orbit insertion burn during the launch that was designed to place the spacecraft on the correct heading to rendezvous with the space station. The pre-dawn landing involved the capsule using twin drogue and then three main parachutes for descent, with the final touchdown cushioned by airbags. Starliner comes home today to White Sands, New Mexico, as the first American human-rated capsule to land on land. Ten seconds to deorbit burn. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. 
The orbit burn in progress. Good control reported. Four OMAC thrusters firing for about 55 seconds to slow Starliner down to begin its return to orbit. All looking good thus far. 40 seconds in, about 15 more to go. Starliner, we can see, is maintaining its attitude. OMAC thrusters are firing. Smaller RCS thrusters are keeping the spacecraft in its position. Good burn reported. Engines cut off. We are on our way to White Sands, Richard Jones tells his team. Starliner's ready to come home now. And flight controllers report that we are in the right attitude and service module module has jettisoned. Crew module is flying on its own. Service module will be disposed of while it re-enters over the Pacific. I'm getting our first and views. We are getting our first views from the NASA WB-57. We see we see their Starliner continuing its plunge through the atmosphere. We are eight minutes and eight seconds from landing. That image is infrared because of it being uh, dark, of course, over the skies of, uh, of New Mexico right now. Still about 28 miles above the Earth as it continues making its way, just about crossing over the New Mexico border now. All systems are reported doing well. Spacecraft is doing well. Altitude, 41,000 meters. Seven and a half minutes till landing, and just a couple minutes now until we should hear about the uh, forward heat shield jettison. The thermal protection system on Starliner, of course, protecting the spacecraft from the heat of, uh, of entry. Slowing speed down now, Mach 3.5. Of course, orbital velocity is Mach 25, so that gives you an idea of uh, the velocity change. Now 17 miles above New Mexico. Starliner remains its proper attitude, proper course. Speed Mach 1.1, 19,000 meters. Landing recovery team has visual on Starliner as it comes down, 10,000 feet. It's about 6.2 miles still above New Mexico, but uh, did just... Forward heat shield deploy. Confirmation of that forward heat shield deploy. Everything... Drogues out. Things will happen fast now. Vehicle is slowing rapidly. Mach 0.2. And landing site reports the sonic booms as Starliner came over. Three minutes, 30 seconds from landing. Mains deployed. And we see three main chutes, three main chutes. Billowing up, we have three main chutes. We see the red, white, and blue as Starliner descends. Two minutes, 53 seconds from touchdown. And the rotation handle has deployed. That will level Starliner as it descends. Base heat shield has jettisoned. That is the base heat shield falling away as planned. Airbags are inflating. And that is the last of the milestones. So now all that's left is for Starliner to float down to the surface of the desert in New Mexico. Everything continuing to look good. Starliner descending under three good main chutes. All six airbags are confirmed to have deployed, and they are fully inflated as Starliner descends to the desert down in White Sands. Just about 800 meters left to go. It's less than half a mile. Less than one minute to landing, less than one minute to touchdown in White Sands, New Mexico. Starliner floating smoothly and softly under three main parachutes. Just 300 meters left to go. That's uh, 984 feet. Very close now. 20 seconds. 20 seconds to landing the first Starliner flight test vehicle. And Starliner touches down in the desert in New Mexico. An historic landing in White Sands, New Mexico concludes the first flight test of Boeing Star Starliner spacecraft, the first time an American-made, human-rated capsule has landed on land. That took place right at uh, 6.58 a.m. Central Time, two days, one hours, and 21 minutes into Starliner's mission. Congratulations, Starliner. Congratulations, indeed. Flawless flight back to Earth. Good landing this morning. Now the uh, spotlight's going to shift a little bit to the landing recovery team waiting for it out there in New Mexico. They have to wait for clearance before they start heading over to the vehicle, but Starliner has touched down at White Sands successfully this morning. Main chutes are jettisoned. That'll keep those chutes from pulling a Starliner away as the uh, landing recovery team is looking to make their way toward it. The landing marked only the second time an orbital vehicle has landed at White Sands, the first being the Space Shuttle Columbia following the STS-3 mission back in 1982. The unmanned Starliner test flight was meant to be the final dress rehearsal before crews started using the capsule to fly to the International Space Station. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine says that while the mission failed to reach the orbiting outpost, it did fly exceptionally well, providing lots of data for review. Ironically, had crew been aboard the spacecraft, they could have overridden the faulty mission clock, instigating a manual orbit insertion burn to reach the space station after all. Starliner was launched aboard an Atlas V N-22 rocket from Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. I guess we should now call it the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. However, the failure to undertake its orbital insertion burn meant the spacecraft was placed in a useless 250 km high orbit, some 170 km short of where the space station was flying. The latest incident follows a launch abort test back in November, during which only two of Starliner's three main parachutes opened. 
That test was regarded as not being serious enough to halt the ongoing program. This mission was meant to help end America's dependence on using Russian Soyuz capsules to transport its crew to the space station. NASA says the capsule, which would be named Calypso after the oceanic explorer Jacques Cousteau's vessel, landed in excellent condition and would now be refurbished ahead of a decision on whether to carry out another unmanned test flight or whether to proceed with a manned flight to the space station instead. Starliner's first manned mission to the space station had been scheduled for early this year. Boeing is one of two companies contracted by NASA under its commercial crew program to develop manned capsules designed to carry crew to and from the space station, thereby allowing NASA to focus on deep space missions using the Orion capsule and SLS rocket to fly crew to the moon and eventually onto Mars and beyond. The other company, SpaceX, successfully carried out its unmanned orbital test flight back in March, flying its Crew Dragon 2 capsule to the space station aboard a Falcon 9 rocket. The commercial crew program is designed as a natural follow-on from NASA's commercial resupply program, which has seen SpaceX Dragon and orbital now Northrop Grumman Cygnus cargo ships carrying supplies to the space station since 2012. That program has now been extended to include a third company, Sierra Nevada. They'll be flying their Dream Chaser space plane carrying up to five tons of cargo on resupply missions to the space station from 2021. They'll be using the new United Launch Alliance Vulcan Centaur rocket, which will be replacing the current Atlas and Delta rockets. Boeing's now transporting Starliner back to the commercial crew and cargo processing facility at the Kennedy Space Center, where it will undergo a complete analysis of all its hardware to see how it survived its orbital spaceflight and to better understand exactly what caused the computer's mission elapsed timer anomaly. Boeing says that should be completed by May. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, NASA says it's all systems go for its new SLS Super Heavy Lift launch system and a special New Year's Day science report looking back at some of the strangest, weirdest and most unusual science stories of 2019. All that and much more still to come on Space Time. The core stage of NASA's new Super Heavy Lift rocket, the SLS, or Space Launch System, has finally been completed in preparation for its first flight, possibly in June. The $8 billion project, which has been under development since the retirement of the Space Shuttle fleet in 2011, will carry astronauts back to the Moon and eventually onto Mars and beyond. Development of the SLS has been hit by 29% cost overruns and delays of almost two years. Its first mission, named Artemis 1, will be an unmanned test flight, carrying NASA's new Orion capsule on a trip to the Moon and back. It'll use the initial version of the SLS, known as the Block 1, which uses four space shuttle-based RS-25 cryogenic liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled main engines, as well as two massive strap-on five-segment solid rocket boosters, also based on the space shuttle's four-segment boosters. The Block 1 upper stage, known as an interim cryogenic second stage, is based on the one currently deployed on the Delta III and Delta IV launch vehicles using a single liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled RL-10 B2 engine. The SLS Block 1 will be capable of carrying a massive 95 tonnes into low Earth orbit and 26 tonnes into lunar transfer orbit. Now, by comparison, the most powerful version of the Atlas V, the 551, can lift 18.5 tonnes into low Earth orbit. The Space Shuttle's payload bay could handle 24.4 tonnes. A Delta IV Heavy can lift almost 29 tonnes to low Earth orbit. The Falcon 9 can lift almost 23 tonnes, while its Falcon Heavy counterpart can increase that to almost 64 tonnes. Currently the most powerful rocket in the American arsenal, pending the introduction of the SLS. Europe's most powerful launch vehicle, the Ariane 5 ECA, can lift 21 tonnes into low Earth orbit, while its replacement, the Ariane 6, will increase that to almost 22 tonnes. Russia's workhorse, the Soyuz 21B, can lift almost 9 tonnes, while its bigger counterpart, the Proton-M, can carry more than double that at 23 tonnes. And China's traditional Long March 3 workhorse can launch 11.5 tonnes, while its big brother, the Long March 5, can lift a reputed 25 tonnes. An upgraded version of the SLS, known as the Block 1B, will replace the interim cryogenic second stage with a new purpose-built exploration upper stage, or EUS, using four RL-10C3 liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled main engines. It'll be able to lift 105 tonnes into low Earth orbit and 37 tonnes into a lunar transfer orbit. The SLS Block 1B will be used on the Artemis 2 mission, which is slated for launch in two years' time. 
This will be the first manned spaceflight of the Artemis program, carrying a crew of four on a 21-day journey to lunar orbit and then back to Earth. That'll be followed by the historic Artemis III mission, which will send astronauts back to the lunar surface in 2024, the first time people have been there since 1972 on Apollo 17. Current plans for Artemis III call for a 30-day mission, with two crew members remaining on the first modules of the planned Lunar Gateway space station, while the remaining pair will use a lunar lander to travel from Gateway down to the lunar surface somewhere near the South Pole for a six-day stay. The final version of the SLS, to be known as the Block 2, is expected to be operational by 2029. It'll be the ultimate heavy lift vehicle, 111.3 metres tall, and using new upgraded solid rocket boosters, increasing overall payload capacity to 130 tonnes into low Earth orbit and 45 tonnes on deep space missions. Now, by comparison, the 110.6 metre tall three stage Saturn V Apollo moon rocket could do more, launching 140 tonnes into low Earth orbit and 48.6 tonnes into lunar transfer orbit. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, a Boxing Day Ring of Fire solar eclipse and a special science report looking back at some of the strangest, weirdest and most unusual science stories of 2019. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The Persian Gulf, India and Eastern Asia have experienced an annular Boxing Day eclipse. Like a total solar eclipse, the December 26 event involved the Moon transiting directly between the Sun and the Earth and casting a lunar shadow across the Earth's surface. However, because just like the Earth's orbit around the Sun, the Moon's orbit around the Earth is elliptical rather than circular. That means there are times when the Earth and Moon are a bit closer together, such as during supermoon events, and other times when they're a little bit further apart, such as now and being further apart makes the Moon look a bit smaller from Earth. So, instead of covering the entire face of the Sun as in a total eclipse, only part of the solar disk is covered, leaving a golden ring, a so-called ring of fire, exposed at the point of annularity. The December 26th annular eclipse saw 97% of the Sun's disk blocked out, providing a spectacular sight. The event began in Saudi Arabia, with a 142-kilometre-wide path of annularity, then spreading across Bahrain, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, India, Sri Lanka, Sumatra, Singapore, Borneo and the Philippines, before finally ending four and a half hours later on the Pacific island of Guam. The longest period of annularity was in Indonesia, and people as far north as Japan and as far south as Darwin and the Pilbara were able to experience a partial annular eclipse. For more details, we're joined by Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. What they call these days a ring of fire eclipse. And that's because the moon won't entirely cover up the sun at the time of maximum. The moon slightly further away from us in its orbit, so it will appear slightly smaller. And therefore, it doesn't entirely cover the sun. And you get a still get a thin sort of ring or an annulus of sunlight around the outside. So a partial eclipse simply means that you're not, uh, from where you are, you are not on the direct line of the eclipse because when the moon um, goes in between the sun and the earth the moon shadow falls onto the earth but it comes down and the earth the moon shadow narrows as it, as it gets towards the earth and the shadow where the totality is is only a couple of hundred kilometers wide so you've got to be within that band in order to see this is the umbra you're field. talking about the preumbra yeah and if you're on the other outside that band you're only going to see a partial eclipse if you're just outside the band you'll see an almost total eclipse but it still will be classed as a, a partial eclipse and the further away you are from that path that middle path you see less and less and less of a partial eclipse and then you get to a point where you don't see any at all. Now the difference between a total eclipse and an annular eclipse is as I said the a total eclipse the moon will completely cover up the sun an annular eclipse the moon will still leave a thin ring of sunlight around it at the point of maximum and that's because the the moon goes around the earth not in a circular orbit but in, in an ellipse so sometimes the moon is further away and sometimes the moon is closer in. When it's closer in the moon looks a bit bigger and when it's further away, the moon is a little bit smaller, and it's just enough to make a difference. The curiosity is that 
the the distance between the Earth and the Sun and the Earth and the Moon work out to be pretty much um, 400. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, 400, the correct ratio. So Sun is 400 times further away from us than the Moon is, but it's also 400 times bigger. So you can, on average, than the Moon because the Moon's apparent size changes depending on its orbit. So yeah, we we are able to see a total eclipse here from the ground here on Earth. We're lucky in that in that respect. There aren't many places in the solar system where you can get a a, a total eclipse, and we get a we can get very long total eclipses that last for many minutes. But as I said, when the Moon is in the point of its orbit, where it's a bit further away and looks a bit smaller. If that happens to be the time when it goes in front of the Sun then it won't completely cover up the sun. All that's complicated by the fact that Earth's orbit around the sun is also elongated, further adding to the mathematics involved. Yeah, the, 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 the unfortunate thing is that, um, it, well, of course they're unfortunate, but all these things are independent of each other. Yeah. The moon's orbit's independent of the Earth's orbit around the sun. The size of things are independent of the size of everything else. It just so happens that sometimes things line up the right way and we can, of course, now predict when those things are going to happen. And, and there are patterns to them, but there's no sort of overall grand cosmic scheme of things that make things have to have to happen exactly this way or that way with sort of clockwork regularity. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Coming up on the Science Report, a special New Year's Day look back at some of the strangest, weirdest, the most unusual science stories of 2019. Included was a study which taught rats how to drive. The rodent rides consisted of a clear plastic jar fixed to a metal plate, all attached to a set of wheels with a copper wire acting as a starter and steering wheel. Researchers found that rats raised in fun homes made better drivers than rats raised in boring conditions but it seems that driving reduced stress for all of them. Then there was a study by Dutch scientists which examined human faeces, finding that the stress of visiting your partner's parents for Christmas dinner can alter the bugs that live in your gut. It seems people who'd been through that ordeal had less of a specific type of gut bacteria than those who experienced a supposedly less stressful Christmas with their own families. These scientists must also surely win the prize for the most unusual opening sentence of a scientific paper. Namely, that Christmas and feces appear to have a traditional yet mysterious connection. Another strange discovery of 2019 was that if people found themselves with a nasty sexually transmitted disease, they wouldn't necessarily head straight to a trained medical professional. It seems that for many Reddit users, the sensible thing to do was to turn to the wisdom of the internet and even include some graphic pictures of their offending STDs for good measure. Researchers found that their sample of 500 posts from a Reddit thread on STD since 2010 showed more than half were requests for a diagnosis, and around a third also included a photo. Interestingly, most posts received a reply within hours. However, the researchers didn't elaborate on the accuracy of the crowdsourced diagnoses. Another study found that generations of sitcom writers are right. You really can make a corny dad joke seem funnier by adding a laugh track. But just be sure those fake laughs sound natural. <laughs> Researchers asked people to rate deliberately dreadful dad jokes on a scale of 1 to 10. Then a separate group, including some people with autism, were then asked to rate the jokes when accompanied by laugh tracks composed of either forced laughs or genuine recorded laughter. And it seems everyone found the jokes funnier with the canned laughter, especially when it was genuine. Then there was Snowball, the sulphur-crested cockatoo, who showed the world his cool dance moves in a video back in July. Turns out, Snowball has 14 spontaneous, diverse dance moves, pulling them off with considerably more finesse than some human dance floor divas. Researchers say Snowball's dance displays may be a sign of genuine creativity, and his moves may be an effort to bond with his human flock. Surely the creepiest story of the year, and one which we covered on the Science Report, involved researchers who triggered some very basic activity in the brains of decapitated pigs that had been dead for at least four hours. The study challenged the idea that the mammalian brain is damaged beyond repair by a lack of oxygen almost as soon as the heart stops beating. The scientists used a system called BrainX, which mimics the normal blood flow, to pump blood through the brains of 72 decapitated pigs fresh from the abattoirs for six hours, and then watched as brain cells survived longer than usual, with some cell activity resuming. 
Some activity was even seen in the animal synapses, the connections between brain cells. But it wasn't enough to save their bacon. The pigs' brains did not recover normal function, awareness or perception. Well, if you thought your heartburn was bad, spare a thought for the poor Australian dude whose chest cavity literally caught a light during emergency surgery back in June. Doctors reported the incendiary incident occurred as the unfortunate patient was having a torn artery repaired. They were forced to increase the oxygen content in his anaesthetic to 100%, when suddenly a spark from a cauterizing device caused a surgical pack to burst into flames. Fortunately, the fire was extinguished immediately and the man escaped unscathed. Perhaps they should have prescribed some anti-inflammatories. Back in October, and just in time for Halloween, scientists announced that they had built an artificial zombie fungus cannon. The bizarre contraption was based on a projectile weapon used by a zombie fungus, so named because it infects houseflies, growing into their brains and controlling their behaviour before killing them. The fungus then grows cannon-like stems from the corpus of its victim and a build-up of fluid then ejects a jet of goo which carries fungal spores to their next victim. Researchers decided to make their own version of the tiny cannon and used it to show that the real thing was an effective way for the sinister fungus to spread its spores to a new host. During the year, we also learned that chimps and their close relatives, bonobos, could bond over binge-worthy TV, presumably enjoying the new season of Orangutan's The New Black. Scientists showed 17 chimps and 7 bonobos a video of a baby chimp playing. They were shown the movie in three different situations, one with a human, one with another ape, and thirdly on their own. Researchers found that they were more sociable towards their viewing partners after enjoying the video. It all suggests that bonding over shared experiences is not unique to humans and may have evolved much earlier than people thought. A word of warning, just don't let them see Planet of the Apes. And finally, if you're annoyed by your neighbour's dog's incessant barking or their constant use of garden power tools at 6 o'clock on a Sunday morning, just be thankful you don't live next door to the white bellbird, Procyanus albus, the world's loudest known bird, capable of an impressive 125.4 decibels. Now, that's louder than a chainsaw or a rock concert, and much louder than the level considered safe for human hearing, around 85 decibels. The males of this Amazonian bird apparently save the most deafening effort for the females perched next to them, swiveling to blast his song's final note directly into the ears of his long-suffering and presumably hard-of-hearing mate. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. FDIC.